So it's my real privilege to introduce an old friend, Dr. Rachel Pickering, who I've known for many years. Rachel has worked in various types of secure environments for more than 15 years. And in the U United Kingdom, she locums at Her Majesty's prisons, Belmarsh, Isis, Thameside and Wandsworth. And she also chairs the Forensic and Secure Environments Committee for the British Medical Association. She's, as well as that, a medical director of Integritas Healthcare, which is a small but growing international NGO, non-government organization, with a real heart for detainees. Uh, they deliver healthcare, expertise, advocacy, research, and training, both for and about detainees. Rachel generally spends about a quarter of her life working overseas, outside the UK, and she enjoys supervising BSc and MSc researchers, including keeping an eye on them whilst they gather data within Western Pacific jails. And we're privileged today because, as well as Rachel, Rachel will be accompanied today by Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Loy Napalan Mam Loy, who is the operations manager of her Western Pacific legal identity, Integridad, heart for de detainees. Tagalog for integrity is Integridad, so I believe. So over to you, Rachel. Uh, take it away. Tell us about Offender Healthcare. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Dr. Saunders. And it's really nice uh, to be doing something again with you. Uh, just to briefly update on my bio sketch, I've recently stepped down from chairing the BMA uh, Forensic and Secure Environments Committee, but that was a real joy to do for many years. So we're just begin, going to be talking about offender healthcare, and it's a real introduction. There's lots of lots of content that we haven't got time to do today, but I hope this is going to be whetting your appetite to learn more. So I'll briefly talk about what I mean about offender healthcare and also tell you a tiny bit more about Integritas, show you a few pictures. And then I base the rest of my talk around ICMDA because that's what we're all here because we're all supporters of ICMDA. I'm going to talk about how offender healthcare is international, about how it should be and can be Christian, about how it's relevant to both medics and dentists and how you can be associated with it if you'd like to learn more. And then at the end, we'll summarize. And as Peter said, we'll take some questions and please do ask questions as well to um, Mam Loy because she knows far more about Western Pacific and Southeast Asian uh, secure environments than I could ever tell you. Right, so just about me, as Peter said, I've known him a long while. I trained in London. I'm an English family medicine specialist known in, in UK English as a GP, a general practitioner. I've worked, as Peter said, for many years in secure environments. And that's basically any place a patient can't get out of, of their own free will. So forensic psychiatric units, immigration centers, uh, police stations, prisons, that kind of thing. I've got special interests in things like minor surgery and palliative care. Autism is a very uh, much in my heart and we see a lot of ill treatment of autistic people, sadly, in overseas jail. And I've also developed a lot of expertise, sadly, in the detection of torture and ill treatment. It's really encouraging that increasing numbers of UK Christian Medical Fellowship members are turning their hand to work behind bars, including the CEO, um, that's Peter Saunders' successor, Mark Pickering, who happens to be my husband. He also locums in prisons. So it's lovely to see a growing band of fellowship there behind bars, fellow Christians. And since 2015, I've been regularly working in the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia. And recently we have acquired two bases in the Western Pacific and I'm speaking to you from there now. So um, just a couple of pictures. Uh, this is uh, us doing healthcare. There's a lot of minor surgery that needs doing. Uh, simple things, removing embedded uh, surgical staples that have been left in way too long would be quite a common one. And also you'll see Mam Loy there is uh, delivering food. During the pandemic, we had to launch a feeding program 
because there's nothing that will damage your health faster than not being able to eat anything. So in some countries, actually, there's very little point in putting in a offender healthcare program because, um, and I can think of one or two African countries, for example, where we've looked at the situation and said, well, you know, actually people here starve, you know, so there's no point in treating your diabetes if you're going to starve to death very quickly. So in some places, food is needed more than medicine. And during the pandemic, we found that in certain Western Pacific police stations. And so delivering food was more important than delivering medicine. Okay. The pandemic also brought new opportunities such as telemedicine and a growing acceptance of the internet, um, Wi-Fi, video conferencing, that kind of thing. And that's been a real joy. Um, expertise, we look at signs of torture and ill treatment and we gather forensic style evidence and that you can see here a body map, which is documenting very clearly signs of excessively tight handcuffing and the sequelae of that. Um, sometimes we have to advocate for people. Um, the photograph you see of a man's chest there is somebody who had uh, surgical staples, many of them inserted into their skin without anesthetic um, as punishment for the fact that the wounds were self-inflicted. If they weren't self-inflicted, they'd have had anaesthetic. Um, and so advocating for people for that kind of behavior to stop amongst healthcare professionals is something that we do. We also advocate for people as a people group. For example, you can see um, in the uh, bottom photo here, and my daughter Zoe, who is autistic, talking about the importance of proper provision for autistic detainees. And so that's advocating for a whole group of people as opposed to one patient. We do research in the field. Um, you can see three researchers there of diverse skin color um, in a little wagon uh, going to a very remote jail in the middle of a jungle. And that was to do a survey of the healthcare needs before we decided what kind of service we might be able to offer in that jail. And we surveyed about 10% of the jail population. And then on the bottom right, you can see uh, some BSc students who are doing in the field research as part of their intercalated medical degree for uh, looking into the understanding of what the mental health is as a concept amongst certain Western Pacific patient groups who are behind bars. And then finally training, we train medical students and other healthcare students on electives. You can see at the bottom, a CMF student there taking a history from a patient and that's in a jail uh, within a particularly challenging part of, of, uh, of the secure environment system. And then we also have another medical student at the top there who is doing um, moulage teaching carers of prisoners' children, how to look after an unconscious patient. So what do we mean by offender healthcare um, and why are we into doing it? Well, it's really the care of any patient who's detained by a criminal justice system. It seems a bit of a stigmatizing word because offender healthcare implies that everybody who we are caring for is guilty of an offense. In reality, though, that's just not true. The vast majority of people, certainly in low and middle income countries, prisons who are waiting for trial, are often found not guilty or are wrongly convicted, but they can wait for many, 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 many years for trial. The longest I've seen is 23 years before being found innocent, yet fined, strangely. So offender healthcare is an umbrella term and it means anybody who is either waiting trial or has been convicted. And it really is a ripe field, a really good potential option for many ICMDA members and supporters. Firstly, it's truly international. Just about every country in the world has an offender healthcare system of an offender healthcare need 
they all have criminal justice systems. Secondly, there are many opportunities for Christian interventions. Thirdly, it's really interesting medicine and dentistry. And fourthly, there are many diverse associations and opportunities, many different ways to do this. It also can be distressing, and I need to warn you about that, potential triggers include sexual assault, torture and ill-treatment, and recollections of abuse, perhaps you thought you had forgotten about. If any of this is a problem to you, please do contact us. We can give you some emotional first aid, and then we can signpost you to some definitive help. So, a bit more about the international side of things. Yes, criminal justice systems are international. They're everywhere, but they're very varied. For example, some things are crimes in one country, but not another. Jaywalking, crossing the road anywhere other than an official crossing when the green man is on. It's illegal in the US, but not generally in the UK, apart from our biggest roads. Homophobia, inspired hate crime is a criminal offence in the UK. In some other countries, being homosexual per se is the offence, not criticising somebody for being homosexual. So you can see that you might end up caring for de very different patients depending on which country you work behind bars in. There are different models of criminal justice there's adversarial versus inquisitorial. Um, most countries tend to have adversarial. And then the way of meeting out and giving justice to victims varies. Restorative justice is getting increasingly popular, but the traditional model is retributive justice. And that can be quite distressing, as you'll see in a minute. And then systems. The UK has a secular court system. In some very conservative Muslim countries, there are Sharia courts that enact uh, Islamic law. In some other countries, there are other religious courts. England tries some people just with a magistrate. Judges on their own hear appeals. But for more serious crimes, when first considered, we have a trial by jury, 12 supposedly independent people. Other countries don't have that. But punishment is where it becomes really controversial. The mildest punishment is a suspended sentence. You know, don't do it again. If you do it again, you'll go to prison. A community sentence could be something like five hours road cleaning. It could be public humiliation, having to wear a sign around your neck and walk around the town saying, I am an adulterer in a town where, in a country where adultery is against the law. Um, financial sentences, such as having to repay what you've stolen or a fine. Deprivation of liberty could be as mild as having to wear an electronic ankle tag that makes sure you don't go outside a certain area or that you're always in at night. On the other hand, it could be imprisonment. And that imprisonment could be one, two days, or your entire life until you die. Either before, during, or after your imprisonment, you could be um, sentenced to corporal punishment. That's official sentence of, say, amputation of a hand, being flogged or beaten. And then in the most extreme, capital punishment. And that could be death by electric chair, hanging, lethal injection, firing squad, you name it. So really different issues, both ethically and clinically, come up for healthcare professionals in different parts of the world's secure environments. Okay. And I was shown this at a conference about 10 years ago. I met a doctor from Asia who said, hello, I'm a gynecologist from Southeast Asia. And I said, Hello, I'm Dr. P. I'm an English prison doctor. And his face fell. He looked really upset. He said, what? How can you do 
such an inhumane job. No doctor in my country will work in our prisons. My government has to import doctors from poorer countries to work in our prisons. I said, well, why should I be ashamed? It's a great job. I'm quite proud of it, actually. He said, because you have to supervise flogging and electric executions, don't you? I said, no, we haven't in England flogged people in prison since 1962. And the last hanging execution was in 1964. That puts a very different perspective on it. But it made me think, could I do that job in his country? Should I, as a Christian, witness to those people, serve those people whilst they're going through those things? Could I do it? So on to being a Christian. Offender healthcare needs Christians. There are a lot of holistic healthcare opportunities for spiritual, emotional, psychological, social care, as well as physical care. And also, detainees are very easy to share the gospel with. They are much less likely to say, I don't need religion. I'm a good person. So I'm definitely going to go to paradise, to heaven. Even if they're not guilty of what they're being accused of now, most of them know that they've made quite a few mistakes in life. So I have never had an offer of sharing the gospel turned down by a detained patient. There's been many times I chose not to do it because I didn't think it was appropriate. But when I have offered it, it's always been something that the people are willing to explore spiritual aspect to healthcare. When I was a community doctor, quite a few of my richer patients would say, oh, I don't need that, thank you, I'm good. What, what do you mean? I'm a bad person. No, thank you. So I love working behind bars because it's very easy to talk about holistic healthcare, very easy to practice it. Stigma makes recruitment to offender healthcare posts in countries where the government provides these doctors and nurses and dentists makes it quite difficult sometimes. Even Christians sometimes feel that they cannot afford um, um, socially to, to associate with prisoners or ex-prisoners. And I can appreciate that. I am not from a culture where stigma is a massive issue personally, but I have many friends and colleagues who do struggle with this issue and everyone has to make their own decision. But for me, I love working behind bars and I encourage as many Christians as possible to do it. And that leads me on to another thing about Christianity and prison medicine. I think we have a biblical mandate to do it. Even before Christian times, even before Jesus came to earth, God cared about detainees. Did you know that in the New International Version of the Bible, the word prisoner is written 26 times in the Old Testament alone? For example, Psalm 102 says, let this be written for a future generation, that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. The Lord looked down from his sanctuary on high. From heaven he viewed the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners and release those condemned to death. That's verses 18 to 20. And then moving into Jesus's teaching and Jesus's life, the Gospel of Matthew, um, the story of the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25, abridged version of verses 36 to 40. The king said, I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. 
And indeed, Jesus went on to be a detainee, a condemned to death detainee, a tortured to death, viciously tortured to death detainee. And towards the end of his time of suffering, during his execution on the cross, crucifixion being the cruelest form of Roman death. This happened in John chapter 19, verses 28 to 30, we read, later, that's on the cross, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they, people around the cross, soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus's lips. When he had received that drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. I thought just today for the first time when preparing this talk, actually, that's somebody giving palliative care to a, a dying, executing person who's being executed. Maybe there is a place for Christians working within healthcare systems of prisons that execute people. But that's very different to actually participating in the execution, supervising punishment. And sometimes it is hard to separate one from the other within certain countries, criminal justice systems. And I don't know what I would do if I was a doctor who lived in a country where the national system endorsed uh, the medical supervision of punishment and execution. I honestly don't know how I would um, reconcile my ethics and my Christian belief and my desire to do prison medicine. Moving on to after Christ, the last 2000 years, the word prisoner is written 24 times in the New Testament. Yes. And in Acts 16, verses 22 to 33, we read this. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Paul shouted to the jailer, who was about to kill himself because he possibly failed in his job of protecting and guarding the prisoners. Don't harm yourself. We are all here. They had not escaped. The jailer brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Then they spoke the words of the Lord to him. The jailer took them and washed their wounds, their torture wounds. And then immediately he and all his household were baptized. Many times I have seen prisoners influenced for the gospel by the witness of other prisoners who are Christian, often those who have been ill-treated. I've also seen prison officers be really touched in the manner of how Christian prisoners deal with their own suffering, including their terminal illness. And it's a joy to be able to see the effect that one person becoming a Christian can have on other people within the jail, both staff and fellow inmates, fellow prisoners. And then in the 20th century, within the last 100 years, there have been countless and still are and will be in the future, countless Christian prisoners, many of whom are in prison for the faith that we share in Jesus Christ. Two quotes from Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was imprisoned by the Nazi regime in World War II, and then executed in the closing days of the war. His letters and papers from prison were collected and they include the following two thoughts. 
Jesus himself did not try to convert the two thieves on the cross. He waited until one of them turned to him. And Dietrich also said, we must learn to regard people less in the light of what they do or omit to do and more in the light of what they suffer. And there are many people who I have said to them, don't be ashamed of what you've done wrong or what you haven't done. You know, we're all human. We all make mistakes. We're all sinners, including me. If I'd had the life you'd have, I'd probably be sitting in the next jail cell to you. I have had a privileged upbringing and a privileged adulthood. Most prisoners have not. So let's not regard people in the light of what they do or omit to do and more consider what they have suffered. And talking of suffering, um, Pastor Richard Vermbrand, who's a Romanian pastor, whom, who was very severely tortured for many years in the communist era, era in Romania, wrote a book about his experiences, Tortured for Christ. I'd recommend it. It's not an easy read, but it's a very powerful read. And he said, it was in prison that we found the hope of salvation for the communists. It was there that we developed a sense of responsibility toward them. It was in being tortured by them that we learned to love them. Now that's a powerful witness. And I'm not sure I could do that if I was tortured. Could you? So just moving very briefly on to uh, the actual nuts and bolts, the uh, medical and dental problems that we see. Most offender healthcare is pretty easy. It's pretty basic primary care. So if you're a family medicine specialist, known as a GP or a primary care specialist, it's pretty easy. Having said that, please don't practice outside of your expertise, outside of your, what we call scope of practice. These are some of the common physical problems. I'm not going to read them all out. I'll just pick out a couple. All chronic diseases, boils, sores on the skin, cellulitis, pneumonia, TB, vitamin D deficiency, worms, infestation with scabies and other things, torture, sadly. And ill treatment, which is not torture, is a wider concept than that. For, in, for example, severe overcrowding or very poor quality food, that kind of thing. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of pictures here. This is one of Integritas Healthcare's volunteer doctors from the UK. In the UK, he would perform uh, minor surgery that wasn't this drastic, but he is skilled to do more drastic things. And here he put his skills to use in sizing and draining a very severe abscess over a prisoner's carotid artery that would, I think a few days later have eroded either into the carotid artery, so he would have bled to death, or else would have spread infection around the bloodstream, and he would have died of septicemia. It's technically easy, as long as you watch the carotid artery. It's just that in high income countries, we send such patients to the emergency room. But a GP who is skilled in minor surgery, like me, like this doctor, can do it. And so we have mobile minor surgery kits. Um, this is a patient um, who I found in a Western Pacific jail one week after he was badly beaten. Those of you who are skilled in maxillofacial surgery, uh, x-rays will see at least five fractures here. And funnily enough, he wasn't in that much pain, but he couldn't open his mouth at all. And so he was starving and dehydrating to death. In the UK, all prisoners with even a simple fracture would have maxillofacial surgery. In 
very resource poor settings, we have to save it for those prisoners who are going to die unless we get them treated. Common psychiatric issues um, vary in different parts of the world, but uh, depression and anxiety, addictions, including substance misuse, alcoholism, gambling, autism, learning disabilities, post-traumatic stress disorder, psychosis, to name but a few. And here we have a patient who was put in solitary confinement five years early, earlier, and our dental survey of him is self-explanatory, as the picture will show he has only two teeth. Not unusual to have very few teeth in hot countries prisons, but that's on the upper end of abnormal, so lots of scope for dentistry. Five years in the dark, though, is going to send you psychotic if you weren't already severely mentally ill. And solitary confinement syndrome is seen in some extreme cases. Uh, he'll also be severely vitamin D deficient. This patient, it wasn't clear if he'd been moved from a communal overcrowded cell to supposed solitary confinement. There is actually another patient further back there. He'd been in this cell for several months and it wasn't clear if he'd been put in there because he had TB or put in there because he was being mentally, um, behaviorally disruptive to the other prisoners. But by the time we saw him, he couldn't stand up. He had contractors in his legs and he did have TB and he was severely mentally ill and he was also vitamin D deficient. So one problem will make another problem worse. Another problem will cause another problem like a domino effect, dun, 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 dun. And then you have a whole raft of complicating factors um, you know, such things like Bureaucracy it can take 20 visits to court to get a patient out to hospital for surgery. Prisoners fear retribution if they talk about their torture and ill treatment. Lack of medical supplies. Patients being non-compliant for various complicated reasons. And also the fact that it is actually a bit more complicated and riskier to work behind bars. You need to have your wits about you and it's not for people to just leap into without training and thinking. So if anybody would like advice, I'm very happy to advise. Look before you leap is a phrase we have in English. And then finally, how can you be associated with this work? Well, as I've already said, stay within the scope of your practice. I am not an ophthalmic surgeon. I'll do minor surgery on people's lumps and bumps, but I will not do eye surgery. I might drain an uh, uh, abscess on an eyelid, but I won't be um, trying to operate on their eyeball. That would be negligent and dangerous, both in my home country of the UK and anywhere else I worked. I have not got the skills. So stay within the scope of your practice. Sometimes doing nothing is better than causing harm with operating outside of your scope of practice. Paid work in countries that have official healthcare services within prisons is often a very easy to get into. Ring up your local prison. If you're a specialist, say an orthopedic surgeon, go and talk to your local prison and offer to do an in-reach clinic once a month. Rather than the prisoners coming to you, you go to the prisoners. If you're a family medicine specialist or a psychiatrist, a nurse or a healthcare assistant, there's probably a job you could apply for based in the prison. If you'd like any advice about whether or not uh, a certain way of doing things is a safe service for you to seek employment in, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. Many countries, in fact, the majority of countries around the world, though, do not have official offender healthcare services. They either send prisoners out to the emergency room or they rely on NGOs, such as the one that I'm privileged to lead medically, or they just 
don't do anything and people either treat each other or people succumb to their illness in jail. If you're interested in getting involved, please talk to us or another offender healthcare NGO. There aren't very many. Talk to Prison Fellowship International um, about what's happening in the country you're interested in. Talk to your local prison officials Talk to the churches, maybe they have a prayer ministry, a preaching ministry, and they know what's happening in your local prisons. If you're interested in voluntary work, please talk to us, whether it's telemedicine based from your home, a placement in the Western Pacific, short, medium or long term, or service development work, work based from home, we can, we've got something for everyone. Most prisons are short of medical supplies and short of money you could donate money you could donate use medical supplies second-hand equipment when your lovely new clinic gets brand new ecg machines donate the old ones nothing is wasted behind bars and lastly pray as i said the word prisoner is mentioned 50 times in one version of the bible and here is a reference to prison. The book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse three. In the Hebrew church is instructed to continue to remember those in prison as if you were together with them in prison and those who are mistreated as if you yourselves were suffering. So I would encourage you to pray in that direction. I'll leave a little summary on there, which is basically offender health care is the care of people who are within the criminal justice system. God cares about detainees. He wants us to care for them too. Most of the medicine is easy and the dentistry. It's just in a specialist environment. There are many opportunities around the world but do take expert advice before you actually get involved clinically, even if you're just advising as a specialist. And please pray for Christian healthcare professionals who are doing this work. There are a growing number of us and we have a lot of work to do because there are at least 11 million detainees in the world. So thank you for your kind attention. Um, Ma'am Loy, and I would be happy to take questions uh, via Dr Saunders. If you want to learn more about offender healthcare, we've got a lot of resources on our website, and you're also very welcome to email us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel, for an incredibly inspiring and comprehensive presentation about a subject uh, where I suspect a lot of us listening don't know that much. I certainly learned a lot in the last uh, half hour. And we've got some time now uh, for question and answer. I wonder, first of all, if, if I could ask you, Rachel, seeing it is such an unusual specialty, and, and I, I suspect many of us have never, uh, have not met many uh, doctors working in offender healthcare, but can you tell us a little bit about your own personal journey and how God led you into the specialty? Was it something that you'd been planning for a long time or was it, uh, what, was it um, uh, through circumstances? Tell us a bit about your personal story. Certainly, and then when I've done that, if it's okay, Peter, I'll ask Mam Loy to tell us why she has a heart for prisoners as well. Please do, please do, that'd be great. So I grew up in a quite a poor English city by British standards. And it had a prison with a very big wall in it. And I remember when I was a child, my dad used to drive me past it. And I'd always think, what's behind there? I was intrigued. Um, when I was a young adult and at medical school, I heard, it was before Facebook existed and social media, but I heard from uh, an old school friend that one of our fellow school friends had gone to that jail. Um, he had made some mistakes in his life and he'd gone to jail. Um, and I 
was a bit shocked, I suppose, because he seemed like such a nice boy. I, I didn't think I would know a lot of people who went to jail. Then when I was a junior doctor, I started training in surgery. I did three years uh, basic surgical training. I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. And I used to love seeing the prisoners who would be brought in handcuffs to the fracture clinic. Uh, where they often had busted knuckles, boxers fractures, dropped knuckles from punch injuries. They often had neglected old fractures with, with malunited bones that had never really healed. And they often had fractured heels because they had jumped down from high buildings, escaping from the police. So their, their calcania were fractured. And this leads to a lot of disability. And the other doctors realized that I liked seeing the prisoners. They didn't like seeing them. So they said, oh, there's another one, another one for you, Rachel. And so I got a bit of a reputation for liking seeing these prisoners. When I was an A&E registrar, um, just back from maternity leave, I saw a very high profile prisoner uh, who has since died, who, was just such a sad little old man, but he was chained up in so many chains and handcuffs and the prison officer had to lift up the handcuff here to make enough space so I could get a venflon, a cannula into the only vein that I could find on him, short of putting a central line in. And I kept thinking, why are they being so cruel? They won't undo his chains. Now I know a lot more about the rules and reasons why, but I wanted to learn. I decided to become a GP, a family medicine specialist, because I thought that at that time training as a, a surgeon was, as a woman, female surgeon in, in the UK was quite difficult with uh, a special needs child. And my daughter sadly proved to have autism by that stage. So I switched to family medicine and I wanted to be a partner to, to be a part of owning a practice. And I was really disappointed the year I qualified as a GP to find that every single partnership opportunity in London seemed to disappear because of changes in the pay structure for GP partners, as opposed to GPs who are employed by GP partners, the doctors who own the, these uh, family medicine practices. And I was really upset. And instead I decided to locum just to be self-employed and I did a sabbatical cover um, at a practice that was a lot more um, low class in a very, very rough part of London, much rougher than the practice I had trained at as a GP. And I loved it. I really loved it. Very few patients could uh, hold down a job. So much substance misuse. There was a, a security guard in the waiting room. Uh, lots of uh, swear words being used, you know, it F U C K I N G hurts doc. I don't mind that as long as people don't swear at me. If they're just describing it, I don't mind. And I realized that these people actually were so grateful for just a little improvement in their very low level of health. Whereas I often get got a lot of complaints of patients who were, had already got quite good health and they wanted our British National Healthcare Service to just make it a little bit better. And I had far more interest in looking after the patients from the lower class end of society. And so I was so happy there that one of the other doctors said to me, do you know, I work for the police in the evenings and the weekends, the London police, we need a woman on our team and we cannot find one who can um, do the job. I think you might be it. Do you want to have a trial? And so only a couple of months after I was so angry with God for making me train in a, in a speciality that I could not be the boss of, I end up finding my niche. And that Friday night, I went to a London police station round the corner from my home to shadow this doctor and see what it was like. And as soon as I stepped through the door, I knew that this is what God wanted me to do with the rest of my life. And that's it. Wow. 
No, thanks so much for sharing that. And Ma'am Ma Loy, would you like to, to share your story too of how God led you into this work yeah. in the West Pacific? Yeah, um, first of all, um, I really love serving, serving people. I know that this is my calling. God, God called me to serve. My former job was serving children. Then I left it. And then um, I I find that I I'm looking for another job and then and 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 I prayed that Lord if I'm going to do another job for I want it to be in service with you also to help other people. Um, then the, there there's Doc Rachel really she's need she's in need of some some assistance like that, and then it's an answered prayer for me. Imagine uh, my heart really is to serve. And then I'm going to serve prison, prisoners. I, I have a story to tell that my, my dad uh, died because someone stabbed him. When my mom was serving in the church, they have this prison ministry. And then she told me that she saw the man who stabbed my, my father. For 10 years, she saw him. And then I asked her, what did you do? What did you say? She, she, she touched my touch her heart, and then she think uh, she said that there's no. Uh, she's not really angry with him. There's a, a forgiveness, you know. There's a forgiveness that that comes in her when the the when the guy who stabbed my father asked for forgiveness to her. Maybe God really called me for this ministry. Imagine I have some relatives who are really in prison. They have been in prison. And I really don't know uh, why God put me. And I know that with, with this kind of ministry, we can help a lot of people, especially detainees, prisoners really, who's really in need, not only food, uh, medical health care, but also Jesus. That's I know that we can share to them. That's the only goal that the Lord will tell me that, share who I am to them yeah absolutely and as Mam Lai has said you know her past experience of what her family has been through helps her in her current compassion for people yeah. and yeah. similarly medically my previous experience training in surgery and doing emergency medicine has not been wasted because actually uh, a doctor who works in primary care behind bars needs to know a lot about acute abdomen, about uh, minor injuries, about how to suture really well, um, surgical suturing, about x-rays, fractures, joints. So God will use your past experiences. Mm. You don't need to fret about the fact that you have taken a change of direction. Mm. Yeah, no, lovely. Thanks for sharing that. And it's wonderful, isn't it, how the Lord will be preparing us for the future that we don't know about. Um, and often uh, the experiences in life we have and the painful ones don't make sense until we look back and see how God used it as part of our preparation for the ministry that he called us into. Uh, Rachel, someone here is asking, uh, how much of your time is spent in non-UK settings? Because your main job I gather is still in the UK, but but how much time do you spend outside the UK at the moment? Before the pandemic, about a fifth to a quarter of my life was outside the UK, either in Europe doing expert witness work or yeah. more, more often um, outside of high income countries. Um, when I'm in the UK, I would still I still do a lot for Integritas writing expert witness reports. Even before the pandemic, there was quite a lot you could do of a video, advising people. Um, there's lots of things that were going on, training people. But I, I'm a missionary in that I do not take a salary. So I have to support myself financially. And I do that through my UK prison doctor work. I've also taken um, a small job in a hospice, which was part of my um, switch from surgery to general practice uh, training. And I look after uh, 
prisoners and other patients from the margins, the edges of society, who have become terminally ill. And that's very nice because it dovetails, it, it fits neatly with the fact that most prisoners who get seriously ill, say with cancer or, you know, drug resistant TB or even a severe chronic disease, most people in poorer countries' prisons are going to die of their serious illness, sadly. And so palliative care is incredibly important in low and middle income countries in general, especially in the jails. So, you know, it complements each other. Well, I was struck by, by you saying, first of all, that most of what you see as a prison doctor is in the, within the realm of family practice or, or general practice, primary mm -hmm. health care, if you like. But of course, there are going to be uh, prisoners who are, who are suffering things that need further investigation, further treatment, maybe hospital treatment or surgery or whatever. Can you just tell us a bit about what the avenues are for referral and treatment outside, both in, in uh, wealthier countries and in lower and middle income countries? Absolutely. In high income countries, such as the UK, um, it will depend on the category of prison. So I, one of the prisons I work at is a high secure prison and we have a hospital, what we call an inpatient unit uh, with mental health care and physical health care cells. We have a palliative care cell. Um, one of the other high secure prisons I've worked at in the past even had a dialysis suite. So we could do dialysis on patients rather than having to send them out with all the costs and security risks to a local hospital three or four times a week. Um, high secure prisons usually have in-house x-ray and you we have mobile MRI scanner that comes in every so often. We have an in-reach ultrasound service as well, that kind of thing. We do up all prisons. You can have blood tests in the UK done. Um, either we will draw the blood or the nurses will do it and it's sent off and it comes, the results come down the computer. So it's very much um, the same as being a community GP in that way. In fact, in some ways it's better. We have more resource to mental health care nursing. Uh, we have more access to psychiatrists than you do in the community. We're very blessed. And that's because the UK practices the principle of equivalence of care for its prisoners. So every prisoner in the community, in, in a prison who's sick should get the same standard of treatment and the same outcome. It might be done in a different way to those with the same illness of the same stage in the community. That's the theory anyway. Some countries do high income country offender healthcare differently but most high income countries will have a similar setup. There is also the concept of in reach where an orthopedic surgeon say, or a dermatologist will come in once a month. There is telemedicine even before the pandemic, but in poorer countries, it really does vary. If there's an official healthcare system in theory, then there will be doctors and nurses and there will be some equipment it varies vastly on what there is but even within Europe many of the jails that I have seen have got health care that would well you and I would not stand for it Peter you know for ourselves or for our relatives and it often depends on what kind of commissioning model is used if the doctors and nurses are employed by the prison system as opposed to employed by the healthcare uh, department of healthcare for that country. So there are lots of things, but the majority of poorer countries in the world actually do not have an official internal system of healthcare. It's just, okay, you're sick. Well, you know, maybe we send you out to hospital, maybe we don't. And that's where um, there is a niche for NGOs such as Integritas to work because it's either us or it's nothing often. And as long as we do a good job, we believe that we're better than nothing. Sure. 
Now, and that brings up the whole question of advocacy and being a voice for the voiceless, I guess. And, and uh, we've got a question here, what can one do in a situation where a detainee or prisoner is being maltreated and you, you, you treat them, you give care, and then they're maltreated again and again and again and again. Is, uh, what, what sort of success have you had and what avenue is there for advocacy in particularly in LMIC context, do, do you have influence and power to be able to change things for prisoners in the way that they're handled? Absolutely. It is a very uh, difficult uh, line to walk. You have to be very careful. Um, we do not let our short-term volunteers just go charging in and say, I want to speak to the prison governor, you know, it has to be handled very sensitively. First of all, you need really good evidence. And secondly, you need, we usually would have a meeting to this uh, internal meeting to decide how to approach it. It's very rare that I would ever raise an issue without the prisoner's consent. Interestingly, in Europe, um, the uh, inspection body that looks at how uh, Council of Europe country members states adhere to Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the, the right to be not tortured and ill-treated. Um, the, there's a committee called the Committee for Prevention of Torture, and their standard is that even without a patient's consent, if you see that a patient has been tortured, you must report it to the authorities, yeah. because it's for the benefit of society as a whole that this be stamped out. Now, I can accept that within a high income country or a Western context. However, within a, a low and middle income countries, even within Europe, sometimes there is a danger to that because actually it, the end result is usually a retributive retribution on the patient concerned, not improvement for everyone as a whole. Yeah. So I'm very careful. I can't think of a single time in a resource poor country setting, I have gone against a patient's wishes, but there are other ways of doing it. You could say, you could go to the prison governor and you could say, hello, sir, hello, madam, you know, it is lovely. Thank you so much for letting us come, you know, be complimentary, thank them for all the good things. And there are always good things that we can appreciate in other cultures. Um, thank you for the hospitality of letting us be here. I just want to say that um, I had noticed that something bad is happening to some patients, and you don't necessarily name the patient, in that side of the prison. Things like this and things like that are happening, and you know people are being beaten for being mentally ill. I'm sure you would not do that, or you would not allow it if you knew about it, and I'm sure you know that actually it is against your country's signature status of the U United Nations Convention Against Torture. Um, and actually, I, want, I think you want to know about this because I'm sure you want to stop it from happening because you would not allow that because you are such an honorable person. And then sometimes we'll follow that up with a letter um, and also an intention to come back and we will come and check that everything is fine. Would you like some training for your staff so that if there are one or two members of staff who do not understand the Convention Against Torture, we will explain it. It is free. We will provide snacks as well and a nice certificate that everyone's attended the training. So you're sort of encouraging from behind and assuming the best to the person in charge. And if you do that, then within hot culture, um, hot climate cultures, you do not bring shame on the leadership. Yeah. It gets much more tricky if the, per the only person doing the abuse is the person at the top of the chain. Oh, yeah. But that's the minority of the time. And I can't think of a single time when actually, when we have come back, that the abuse of that person has been continuing. 
it's very time intensive. But if you get a reputation for being an NGO who actually will pay attention to these details, then they let you, you often find that the actual background abuse lessens, the rate of abuse lessens. The other thing is how you interpret it. Um, if you say to um, a prisoner um, in a remand jail waiting for trial, tell me, when you were in the police station, were you tortured into confessing that you did this thing? And they'll say, oh no, no, I wasn't tortured. But then if you rephrase it and say, okay, let me rephrase that. Were you beaten until you confessed? Oh yes. It's just their definition of torture is so high. You know, beatings are so common for so many people that the word torture, you know, you would have to have your fingernails pulled out or something really graphic for them to say, yes, I was tortured. So in some countries, it depends what word you use. And if you take the word torture out of the word and, and talk about all the positives of treating people nicely, rather than doing nasty things like not enough food and beatings, then it, it, it goes down a lot better. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's great. And, and I'm really sorry, but that's all we've got time for to, today. Uh, the time has literally flown past. We've got more questions, but we, we have to draw things to a, a halt now. Um, so we've been listening to Dr. Rachel Pickering talking about offender healthcare and also Mam Loy Napalan with, with her as well. So it just remains for me to say thank you once again, Dr. Rachel Pickering, for, uh, for all your time and preparation and speaking to us today and, and just for the uh, wonderful example you're setting and, and, the, and the gracious way that you go about it, uh, even in terms of talking to some some quite tough customers as well. So, uh, and may the Lord really bless you and grow your work. And Ma'am Lloyd, thank you too for all you do and for your sharing today. And to all of you today who've made the time to come along to ICMBA webinars, we look forward to seeing you again soon. May the Lord bless you. Yes. Bye.